point of these series um, is to welcome um, viewers into um, conversations that I'm having as I get to know Miami and as I'm welcomed into a new community. And today I'm sitting with Mr. Philip Church, who I've only just met in person, but who, in my opinion, um, we had a very engaging conversation um, over the phone um, like two or three months ago now, mm -hmm. yep. which was really sparked by my interest in trying to unpack the Shakespeare in the Schools program that Gable Stage has been um, doing with you at the helm mm. for the last... Last six years. Six years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We uh, started out with Julius Caesar. Um, and then Taming of the Shrew was after that, The Tempest after that, um, Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, you know, on the books for this coming spring, uh, King Lear. And I thought for all sorts of different reasons, King Lear would be a great play, and I was looking at it from a kind of traditional point of view, which was, well, it's, it's intergenerational, We've got lots of meat on the bone to, to discuss with uh, high school students with that alone, right? But then when the crisis, which we are now in, still in, uh, if not even deeper, the crisis of eviction uh, happened through the pandemic and people's inability to uh, pay the rent, to pay the mortgage, uh, not having jobs with income, landlords not able to pay their bills, I suddenly thought eviction has got to be a theme. And of course, Lear is evicted, right, yeah. from his castle. So who would Lear be if he's evicted by his children, right, after he has divided up his land? Land, I went land, okay. Um, is he a developer? Mm. Is he, a re is he king of real estate? Is he king, is it Lear Properties king of real estate? Ha. Huh. Okay, so this is kind of how the, the, the dots start to get joined. Then this morning I was reading the Herald and, and this awful and tragic um, situation with the Surfside yeah. Champlain uh, condo. And this is a quote from one survivor and it, and it made me think of, uh, of course about her misery and the misery of many uh, condo owners um, in that building. But she said, uh, I saved my life. I lost everything. My house, my belongings. I had my house full of things. I lost everything. I have nothing now. Mm. And I suddenly realized that this woman and that tragedy is feeding this theme of loss and the value of things. Mm -hmm. Not to say that things must not have value, of course they must, but it's now uh, life versus things. And I thought, oh gosh, here we go. This is another theme that will come out of King Lear, mm -hmm. is the value of life versus property versus things and 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 so these uh these school tours that go out through gable stage um only have one purpose and that is to get conversations started with high school students uh, on really serious themes that they need to be engaged uh, with and so they also realize that the fictional characters that, that shakespeare wrote are only there for one purpose and that is to motivate us and inspire us into conversations today and conversations tomorrow, which lead, hopefully, to actions. Exactly. Not just more conversations, but the conversation results in action. Yeah. And, and uh, we, we always leave schools with, now, what can you do about this? What can you do? But again, based on uh, Shakespeare's play, uh, and the characters that serve as agents yeah. for the message. And that's all they are. And I think that's all, all Shakespeare actually thought they were. You know, his parents in his plays were agents mm. uh, of a message. 
and I think with he never said it that way, never thought it that way, but as a writer, motivated to send messages to that audience, many of whom could not speak, could not write, uh, could not read uh, or write. And uh, I think uh, that's got to be the, the propelling motivation for us doing Shakespeare in the first place, whatever generation we're in, whatever era we're in. Uh, it's not just keeping Shakespeare alive for the sake of Shakespeare. Uh, it's, it's so much else, because we all recognize and understand theater as and film by extension, and ballet and opera as entertainment, you know. We, yes. we understand that, and it's so necessary. Um, I don't really know what the word entertainment means. That word to me, when I was in Maine, the theater, when we first got there, a casino had just been built. Uh -huh. And I hate casinos. And, uh, <laughs> Welcome to Miami. <laughs> and the theater was constantly put in the same category as the casino, yeah. as entertainment. Yeah. And then I learned during COVID that congressionally, there are two separate um, two separate sectors. There's mm. arts and culture, and there's entertainment. Mm. And I was like, "Oh, we're arts and culture. Yeah, entertainment yeah. to me is so thin." Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I think we've we've got to give. We must continue to give entertainment its due and say. England and Europe and, and, and America even, following World War I and World War II, the only one of the big uh, foundations that got the nations back on its feet was the entertainment of morale-boosting event. Yeah, that's right. That's Delight. right. And it wasn't just people forgetting no. uh, the horror. No. of what they just went through and how many family yeah. members they lost in a world war. Right. But it was the morale boosting. So you go back to vaudeville and you mm. go back to uh, music hall. Yeah. Uh, that's serving a purpose through entertainment, right. uh, cathartic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's absolutely essential. And and that needs to remain. There need needs to be those theatres that produce entertainment for for no other reason than to to offer a cathartic experience to an audience. Totally. Uh, let's say the Miami audience, uh, generalizing hugely here, but but in in light of the Surfside tragedy, mm -hmm. um, in light of uh, hurricanes that we've had totally. and things we've been through, um, that that audiences need to go back and find a semblance of normalcy. Then we have the other uh, kind of theater, uh, born out of sort of forum theater, uh -huh. which is is totally Greek, quite yeah. honestly. And it's there for a purpose. Um, it's unadulterated. It's unapologetic. Yeah. It is educational. Yeah. And and your your theater experience has a message, and it comes over loud and clear. Right. And while it could be entertaining, yeah. Its bottom line is that it serves a purpose to turn the hearts and minds of people in a direction yeah. where hopefully they'll leave the theater or leave that space, that performing space and, and uh, possibly help the world become a better place to be totally. for the neighbor, for your family members, for totally. whatever. So I'm talking to Philip Church, who um, is an associate professor at FIU for 36 years, 40 no, years? No, well, 41. Who's counting? 41 <laughs> <Who's> years. Count <laughs> <laughs> He's also artistic director of What If Works. What If Works, yeah. Um, and has been helming Gable Stage's Shakespeare in the Schools program through his company, What If Works, for the last six years. And we are enjoying a conversation over coffee and treats from Macondo Coffee Roasters. Uh, this, is a, this came from the Kendall location, which is um, a franchise of the original location in Doral. And um, this franchise is owned by a Venezuelan company, but the owners of Macondo are Colombian. This is Colombian coffee with Argentinian treats. <laughs> so it's a little uh, Latin America fiesta. I love it. Yeah. Love it. Wonderful. Um, so yeah. Mm. Um, so let's go back. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
how did you, so you, when did you see your first play and ah. did that, <laughs> did you at that moment want to be an actor or you just wanted to be near that world? Of well, okay, so I brought this and uh, Magnus may want to take just the photograph. Oh. In that, yes, now the, the title of this play, uh, this was a long time ago when my father was actually an actor. He was an amateur wow. actor in England. Okay, but that's that's in a play uh, called Born to Be Gay, hmm. and that was before gay was no, that was Born to Be Joyful. Yeah, right. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> many years ago. So there is my father. My you dad. look just like him. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, but basically he he was actually in the hay and straw business in the south of england so wow. he sold uh hay and straw to um, racehorse owners so we would go farm to farm uh where they trained <coughs> and bred racehorses wow. and and his job was as um a salesperson selling uh prime hay and, and straw but on the side he was an amateur actor and in england amateurs um, are thought of very highly. Uh, to give you an example, uh, in Bournemouth, uh, part of where I grew up was Bournemouth, which is right on the coast, south of England, uh, the amateurs shared the, the professional stage. Uh, the theatre was called the Palace Court Theatre. Mm. And the amateurs were given X number of weeks a year to stage their productions. So it, it was... It, it, <laughs> Seeing professionals and amateurs together on stage and no contractual uh, issues or problems at that time, it was a wonderful thing because it, it wasn't that, that the amateurs were in professional productions, not at all. You know, those were equity productions and this was an a, a amateur company. But the fact that the theatre itself gave itself over to uh, amateurs to come in. And those amateurs, of course, uh, from all walks of life with, you know, with, with a huge variety of jobs uh, and employment during the day. But at night, um, they were passionate about theater and, and uh, you know, uh, developing theater. So that was a huge example when I was very young as to how the two can really work together. Um, when I, when I got over here and I actually came to Miami, uh, the community had many more community theaters. Um, we then slid into a period in the late 80s where theater started to be called non-equity. And that's where the community theater started to disappear. Um, it became non-equity uh, theater companies. They were still not professional actors, equity actors but they dropped the moniker of community theater. Um, and to some extent, I, I kind of feel it's a shame um, because amateur theater, community theater, it, it so smacks of something that is of the community. Uh, not to say that professional companies are not that. Of course they are. But they, uh, they operate under much you know, higher regimens of, of uh, yeah, un union, uh, do's and don'ts, rules, regulations, and so forth. And community theaters are obviously so much more open. Uh, it's the neighbors coming together. Yeah, you know. it's the dentist. It's yeah. everybody can do it. That's right. That's right, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, going back to, to my beginning, when I was nine, I managed to, uh, to be cast in a play, playing a, a, young, uh, a young child with my father in the main lead. It was called Woman in Black. And that was the, the ghost first... Story? Yeah, yeah. The that, ghost story? Yeah. The ghost story. That's right. And that's when I, I first stepped on stage, uh, you know, uh, uh, to perform. And performance was it. So I went to the London Academy of Music and Dramatic yeah. Art after leaving grammar school. So when you were there, were you 100% focused on acting? Oh, yeah. It, it, that's, that's what it is. Absolutely. Um, they don't, uh, 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 most training, training schools uh, over here take the actor into uh, design areas, which, which is fantastic, you know. So they get set design, costume design, mm -hmm. lighting, 
sound and all that. Um, but at the conservatories and the, the academies, it's really only performance. Mm -hmm. And that's, and your whole day, it's either mime or, or movement, voice, singing. Yeah. Uh, when I left Lambda, the first job I got, and I think, that's, uh, I, I think that job uh, pretty much inspired the rest of this with What If Works and all that. First job I got was with Brian Way. Mm. Now, you may not know Brian Way, but, but um, over there, he, he was one of the pioneers of theater and education. Uh -huh. And he built his company, <coughs> which went out to prisons, to high schools, uh, to community centers, and he would, uh, he would examine Shakespeare, he'd examine classics, he'd take a novel uh, and adapt it mm. and have audience participation at, at a time when, and we're talking 70s, at a time when uh, all of this immersion yeah. that we think is so new and so... <laughs> right. he, he was doing this and it was beginning to happen. Right. Uh, uh, back then, you know. Yeah, it was like Augusta Bowal time and like all of that community centric. That's right. Yes, That's yes, right. yes. And so theater, uh, you know, I don't want to sound pretentious saying this, but theater for a purpose, right? Yeah. That's where I first got introduced to it. And it was a huge difference from, uh, you know, studying Chekhov and, and uh, doing theater and yeah. the traditions of theater, uh, admiring it worshipping it sometimes, you know, um, and suddenly you're doing theatre for a totally different reason. Yep. And it felt good. It really felt good. And I think that was the trigger to, um, you know, to where we are today was working with Brian Wade, who became really big in England as, uh -huh. as a leader of theatre and education. Yeah. yeah. And in fact, one thing I should mention about training in, in, in England, and I think Europe in general, is that um, we were sent out we were mandated to go to X number of um, art galleries uh -huh. uh, to study our characters from paintings that existed. So we had to find the character we were playing uh, somewhere in the, uh, you know, the portrait, uh, Royal National Portrait Gallery. Uh, we had to go to X number of ballets, X number of concerts, mm. symphony concerts. Um, not just go and see theater. Right. And I think those other art forms were hugely important in, in the development of, of, of young actors. Yeah. Uh, just getting a sensibility. Now, if you're moving into directing, which is what I did, then, you know, it, it's pretty evident how important those, you know, those other arts have been in terms of experiencing them, not just knowing they're there, yeah. but actually you know, experiencing them. Um, but over here, we don't, uh, you know, most programs do not expect students to necessarily be going out to galleries or going. It's great if they do, but it's not part of um, a curriculum. Yeah, you know? you're right. You know, and, and I, think, I think there's space for it. <laughs> yeah, You know, totally. Some yeah. of the, um, I did some work in Atlanta with a, uh, with a, a, a teen group at um, the Woodruff Art Center in Atlanta, mm. where the Alliance Theater is, and the High Museum of Art, and the Atlanta Symphony, and um, mm -hmm. they had a, a teen board, yes, which yeah. was fabulous. And the teen board um, would go to the, the symphony, they'd go to the museum, and they would go to the theater and engage in some really interesting conversations about what is art mm. and these were like teen board members right which is right. also a really really fascinating concept and something I'm also really interested in is give people the tools no a young person doesn't know what it is to be on a board and they certainly don't know how these um, mm, so institutions work mm. but even just taking it back to a more um, pedagogical place of what is art you know yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Is this art? This is probably art, right? Why not? Oh, you're the food. Yeah, oh, absolutely. absolutely it's art. Right? Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna cut it with well, a fork. Yeah, and I think uh, you know, I think in in general, um, you know, cuisine has become such an art form. Totally. I mean, literally, they're painting uh, when they put swirls. Oh my in, god. You know, garnishings and so totally. on. Totally. But it, they're like pieces of art, and you think, how can I? 
how can I start eating this? I just want to look at it <laughs> and hang it on the wall. You I know, know but also no. just the, <laughs> um, the talking about delight, the delight, uh, the sensuality of taste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, uh, you yeah. know, also an art form when it's off. So, okay, so this isn't going to be a pretty, uh, well, no, it is pretty. There oh, you I go. Don't think we care about My, it. I know, it doesn't matter oh, at that's this wonderful. point how it that's looks. Wonderful. Mm. So, we are um, enjoying um, South American pastries from Macondo. Macondo. Coffee Roasters. <laughs> uh, did you try it? Uh, and I'm Not yet. Okay, we're going to do it together. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, it's wonderful. I have to phone a friend. This is called a alfajor, alfajor which is an Argentinian mm. pastry. Mm. Delicious. It's like a shortbread kind of cookie with yes, a... Yes, it is. Uh, yep. And the, um, and oh the, the filling, um, it's, it, it's sort of like butterscotch. Yeah. So... It is like butterscotch. So your family moved at some point to Eagle Rock. Yeah, they did. Mm -hmm. We had a <clears throat> we had a pub. You did. In, <clears throat> yes, in in um, in uh, Dorset, okay. uh, south of England. Yeah, the Britannia. So your father stopped selling hay. Yeah, that's right. Um, and they uh, they bought a pub in um, in uh, Sherborne, in Dorset, which is a small village and <clears throat> renovated it. It was the most incredible renovation you've ever seen. Um, it had a very high ceiling and in the uh, private bar, because you know in England you have a private bar mm. and you have a public a, bar, right? Yeah. yeah, I know, it's all about <laughs> 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 uh, Yeah, so the private bar, they literally built in, this tells you how big that room was, uh, they built in a false cottage mm. with a thatched roof how fun. And the, the bar itself, okay, they would, they would be seen through these sections of this cottage where hmm. they would be serving people. Yeah. And all the furniture was wicker. It was great. The ceiling was painted dark blue with stars. You and know. did your father like get all of his <laughs> theater friends to make this thing? No. It's really interesting. Uh, my father didn't have a theater community except when they met to rehearse Interesting. and do the yeah mm. it was it was more work a day it wasn't all about gathering you know uh, we're 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 th you know we're amateur theatricals here um, so we constantly have our gatherings and it, no that didn't happen or at mm. least I wasn't aware of that mm. um, and that's an interesting point uh, they were all working. I yeah. mean, Dad's Dad's job now was the owner of of a pub, right? Um, so, uh, you know, one can only imagine how much uh, time and effort it took to uh, cut off from the work thing, and and uh, you know, put your focus on on a production. But you can see from this photograph here the quality of the costuming, yeah. the quality of the sets, yeah. and so amateur. Uh, amateur theatricals were as as professional in their production as professional productions were you know mm -hmm.